God bless everyone tonight. I'm happy to see you. And I think you might be happy to see me too. The Lord bless all of us together as a family in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your people, our leaders, our pastors, your servants. We're asking, oh Lord, you bless everyone mightily tonight in Jesus' name. Make us more useful in your kingdom, more profitable to your people. And we pray, Lord, or we'll carry joy and success and progress to the local churches and all the places we minister in Jesus' name. Open our eyes once again to behold wonderful things out of your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Tonight we are looking at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Let's come to 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter it says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. And in 2 Peter it says, I am a servant as well as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1. In Romans chapter 1, looking at verse 1, Paul a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Are you following the trend? Peter says, I'm an apostle, I'm a servant. And here Paul, the apostle, says, I am a servant of Jesus Christ, but I'm called to be an apostle. The apostle is a servant, and this servant is an apostle. I'm coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're reading from verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made my, myself servant unto all. It's an apostle. This is Paul writing. And he says, I have made. The Lord has called me to be a servant. And I have come under that garb and under that garment, under that title of servant. And I make myself a servant unto all. Philippians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 1. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which I Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. Here Paul the Apostle also identifies himself with Timothy. Timothy was not an apostle, was a teacher of the word, a pastor in the church at Ephesus. And Paul the Apostle said, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ. And he says, we're servants to the church, and we're servants to the people, even to the bishops and to the deacons, and then to the members as well. Titus chapter 1. We're reading from verse 1. Titus chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 1. It says, Paul is servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm reading all this for you to understand that when Peter says, I'm an apostle, but as an apostle, I'm a servant, it's not an isolated case. It's not something that only Peter said, but Paul said the same thing. And when you come to James chapter 1, James chapter 1, verse 1, James is servant of God. God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James also is servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jude, I'm reading from verse 1. Jude verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. Jude, 
the servant of Jesus Christ. These are exalted people. And these are people that have been chosen by the Lord, ordained by the Lord, established by the Lord, and their office was great apostles. And yet they saw themselves as servants. How do I see myself? Do I see myself as a person exalted above the church of the living God, a man in authority, a man with power, a man of decision, a man of conviction? Or do I see myself like Paul, like Peter, like James, like Jude, like they saw themselves? They were servants to the church. Come to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto the, unto the his servants, that is, all the people he'll be writing to, the angel of the church in Ephesus, in Smyrna, in Pagamos, in Tatyra, in Smyrna, and also in Sardis, and the angel of the church in Laodicea, all of them I'm writing to you, but understand, you might have the title of angel, of apostle, or whatever, you are his servants. And he's writing things which must shortly come to pass, Look at this, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his, tell me, his servant John. John, an apostle, of course, the beloved apostle. And yet he emphasized, I'm just a servant, a servant John. As we look at uh, what you are studying tonight, I'm talking to you on the servanthood of leaders in the church. The servanthood of, t of leaders in the church. Thank God you're a leader. Thank God I'm a leader. Thank God we're all leaders here and the Lord is developing us. But he wants to develop in us the conviction of a servant. He wants to develop the consecration of his servant. He wants to develop the outlook of his servant. He wants to develop the attitude of his servant. As we stand on the pulpit and we look at the congregation of the people of God, the pulpit is raised up, not because we're so higher than the people, but so we can see the congregation easily and the congregation can see us easily. We're still the servants of the people. People will see, and the people were ministering to tonight the servanthood of leaders in the church. Three points we're looking at number one the calling and conviction of apostolic servants. These were not ordinary servants, they were anointed servants, yes, appointed servants, yes, appreciate, appreciated servants, yes, approved servants, yes, but in particular apostolic servants apostolic servants the calling and the conviction of apostolic servants number two the comprehensiveness that's another word the complete of uh, uh, like completeness the comprehensiveness of the commission in the apostolic service apostolic service as we are sent forth uh, being an apostle means we are the saint ones he has sent us he sent us for his service and it is apostolic service and we have the comprehensiveness and the, of the commission in the apostolic service point number three the consecration and cultivation of apostolic servanthood the consecration and the cultivation of apostolic servanthood let's come to number one number one the calling and the conviction of apostolic servants he calls us to be servants and when he calls us he calls us to serve the people he has the message of salvation for the people angels could have done it he himself could have continued to do it he could do it from heaven but he gave us that message the message of grace the message of mercy and the message of love the message of eternal life to go and give to the people he sent us like he sent the apostles we the saint ones are servants we're serving god 
We're serving the people to you. They're waiting for us. And they want the bread of life from us. And the bread of life through us. And we go to them with the attitude and the conviction and the calling of a servant. Look at First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. I read from verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort who am also an elder. You could have said who am who I am an apostle, but he dropped that title so that people will not think we cannot be like him and we cannot stand by his side, we cannot touch him and we cannot go near. He's so high up. He said, you are elders and I'm writing to you as an elder to you, a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Then he said, feed the church, the flock of God. That's what we do. We're serving them the bread of life. And we are servants. He says, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, and not with, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. We're willing and we're ready. And any time any member of the congregation is in need, we we'll remember, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm to serve. And that's why I am a servant. We're ready and we're willing. Then in verse 3, neither being as lords over God's heritage, neither being as lords, as the one that is calling the shots, as the one that has authority, as one that says, go there, go there. No, we're not like that. We are servants, and we're to serve the people, not lording things over the people of God, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd he identifies Christ as the chief shepherd and we are shepherds and we're serving the sheep and taking care of the sheep when the chief shepherd shall appear we ye shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away your reward will not fade away you will not lose your reward servants we are servants I am say a servant I am to the church a servant I am to the Lord. Uh, what's the attitude and the calling of a servant? Matthew chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 9. Matthew chapter 8, we're reading from verse 9. It says, for me, man under authority. That's the attitude of a servant. I'm a man under authority. I'm a woman under authority. What's my title? Forget about that title now. Whatever the title is, you are a man, you are a woman. I am a person under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goes. That's a servant. I say to this man, go, and he goes. He does not uh, look at, you know, that commandment, that commission, and that directives. Why am I going? Why is it me that will go? If I don't go, what's the consequence? Why are you telling me to go? I don't want to go now. A servant doesn't have that choice. He says, I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another come, and he cometh. Why should he go and I shall come? There's no argument, and there's no carnal comparison. And then he goes to say, in that verse 9, he says, And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Do this, you don't have to explain. You don't have to, you know, convince me. I'm a servant. And because I'm a servant, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Do this, and it is done. You will do the will of God. Matthew chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 27. Matthew chapter 20, verse 27. And when we do this as servants, we do it with a cheerful heart. 
I was a willing mind. I would do it without questioning and without looking at, you know, the commandment as if this is strange. Why should I do that? Remember who servants are and remember that we are servants. Matthew chapter 20, verse 27. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. You remember he gave some apostles, he gave some prophets, he gave some evangelists, he gave some pastors and teachers. Which title do you think is the greatest, is the highest? He said, okay, whatever title you are thinking is the highest, whosoever will be the chief, the highest, the apostle, or any other title you want to claim, anybody that will be that among us, let him be your servant. Then he says, even as the son, the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. You see the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ, the conviction of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that conviction eventually came into them. I mean, all the apostles and the arch that conviction were servants, were servants, were here to serve God. And he can send us anywhere, he can make us do anything, and whatever he commands us to do, we our servants look at their prayer in acts chapter 4 verse 29 acts chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 29 it says in verse 29 and now lord behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants they didn't say and grant unto us the apostles do you understand? They were the greatest in the church. They were the greatest in the nation. They were closest to God, closer than any Pharisee and any Sadducee. And they had a work to do that no, eh, no person on earth could do. And there was a great privilege. And yet, all they could say is, O oh Lord, behold, their are threatening and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word. They saw themselves as servants. I pray we'll see ourselves like that. I will see myself like that. I will see myself like that. And the Lord will bless your conviction as a servant in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 1. I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. I'm separated unto the gospel of God. I'm a servant, but that doesn't mean that I scatter all my strays everywhere. I go into this, I go into this, I go into that. He said, I'm a servant that is separated unto the gospel of God. What I am to do in my servanthood is related to the gospel. Lifting up that gospel, preaching that gospel, teaching that gospel, emphasizing that gospel, living in that gospel, encouraging other people to come into that gospel. That's my servanthood. It says, uh, the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures. Look at verse 14 now. I am debtor because I'm a servant and I need to serve and I have the bread of life and I have the food and the people are hungry and be debtor to them. If they die in hunger, I've not fulfilled my service as a debtor, as a servant. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. I cannot look down on the barbarians. I cannot look down on the Greeks. I cannot look down on the Gentiles. It's like the landlord or the householder or the father in a house has employed me as a servant. 
and I'm to serve food to all the children. Some of those uh, children might be sick. Some of those children might not be well behaved. Some of those children might have some peculiarities. And you may not like every scene. Some of those uh, children, do you but you understand? You're a servant to the household. And because you're a servant to the household, you have to take that bread and to take that food unto everyone. And your feeling doesn't come into it. And your sorrow doesn't come into it. And your attitude must not be a negative attitude. I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. I'm not asking why is she not wise? Why is she not wise? I'm a debtor to her. I'm a debtor to him because I'm a servant of the Lord and Christ died for the wise and for the unwise so as much as in me is. I'm not going to reserve any strength. I'm not going to reserve any skill. I'm not going to say, no, this talent I have, he is not good. He is not qualified to receive the best from me. No. As much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone. And I'm a debtor to everyone. I'm a servant of God, a servant of Christ, and I'm to serve the people of God everyone no matter who they are they're doing things uh, you don't like they're doing things god doesn't like but god loves them and god sent jesus to die for them all the people in the church the high and the low the small and the great it says everyone that believeth to the to the jew force and also to the greek i pray that the lord himself will teach us this and make us servants of the people of God, of the church of God, in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 5. Second Corinthians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 5. For we preach not ourselves. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus sake ourselves apostles ourselves prophets ourselves evangelists ourselves pastors and teachers we are your servants for Christ's sake and we're your servants because of the gospel that should change our attitude as we relate to with our pastors we relate with our leaders yes we respect them yes we honor them but we don't idolize them we don't put them over there we cannot even talk to them we cannot even approach them why oh he's my leader is my pastor is my overseer that's true that's true thank god for that respect but we leaders ourselves we should comport ourselves in such a way that we are approachable because it says we are your servants for jesus sake the lord confirmed that in our lives in our ministry and will be of great tremendous benefit to all the people of God in Jesus name Colossians chapter 4 we're reading from verse 12 Colossians chapter 4 verse 12 Epaphras who is one of you a servant of Christ that's an important title that's the important ministry a servant of Christ salutes you always laboring that's what a servant does always laboring and laboring fervently for you in prayers that she may stand perfect and complete in all the will of god our calling and our conviction as apostolic servants point number two now in point number two the comprehensiveness of the commission in the apostolic service the apostolic service what's our service as apostles because we have service like the apostles let me read acts of the apostles chapter 1 
Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 and we're reading from verses 1 and 2. Acts chapter 1 verse 1. The former treatise of I made O Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Jesus began both to do and to teach. That's the summary of everything that Luke wrote to Theophilus. That's the summary of Christ's ministry on earth. That it is something he did and it is something he taught. But then he said, Jesus began. He said, Theophilus, everything I wrote to you from the beginning of Luke until the end of Luke, Jesus began. Jesus began both to do and to teach. What's the implication? He didn't end it all. The population of the world is still there. And all those people, inhabitants of the world, are still there. What Jesus began. He has now given unto us the apostles, the servants, and were to carry that through, and were to carry that forth. Began both to do and to teach. Please come to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 30. Mark chapter 6, verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. What they had done and what they had taught. And you know, Jesus Christ, he began to do what they had done. And they began to teach what they are taught. That means then, as apostles, they were to carry on all that Jesus Christ began to do and to teach. And so as you think about the comprehensiveness of our commission as apostolic servants in the apostolic service, what does that mean? Number one, seek to save lost souls. That's what Jesus did. He sought the lost so that he could save them. And we are doing what he did and we're teaching what he taught. Number two, we preach that sinners repent. That's what Jesus did, what he began to do and to teach. We're preaching that sinners will repent. Number three, we're calling us sinners to faith in Christ. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That was the emphasis of Christ. What he began to do and what he began to teach. That's what we do. We are carrying on. The ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number four, we're leading converts to righteousness. Leading converts to righteousness. He spoke about righteousness. And he said that everyone that comes into the kingdom will have inner righteousness. Spiritual righteousness. And as we comprehend our commission... We're telling the sinners to repent. We're leading them to faith in Christ. We're helping them to have salvation. And we're leading those converts that they get converted to righteousness. Number five, we emphasize heart sanctification. Emphasize instantaneous sanctification. It's not something gradual, gradual, gradual. They are getting into. He prayed and he said, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then with that sanctification, we lead them to practical holiness. Practical holiness. The sanctification is instantaneous, it's in their heart. And the outward expression of that sanctification is the practical holiness holiness in their family 
holiness to their children, holiness to their spouse, holiness in their community, holiness everywhere. And then we make the sanctified believers seek and experience the baptism in the Holy Ghost. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus taught. And if he began to do and to teach, that's what we do also. We continue to do and to teach. Number seven, we pray for the sick. We pray for the sick and we prevent further sickness. You see, when Jesus prayed for the sick, they got healed. After they got healed, they said, go and sin no more. Lest they was sin, come on thee. It's not only to pray for the sick and make them experience healing. We want to prevent further sickness in their lives. That's what he did. He began both to deal and to teach. And we continue both to deal and to teach each we deliver your prayers. That's why he gave us the power. He gave us the anointing to cast out devils. And when we have helped the people and they're free from their demonic oppression, we also have a hedge of the word of God around them that those evil spirits will not penetrate again. Let me have a good amen. Number nine, we train members and ministers to be faithful and fruitful. That's what Jesus did. He called us those disciples. He trained them. He transformed them. He helped them so that they will be faithful and so that they will be fruitful. And he gave uh, many illustrations and parables and teachings on faithfulness as well as on fruitfulness. We're not just there. What were to do comprehensively? What were to do in our commission can be broken down into these small, small items. And then we're marking them. Praise the Lord, I'm doing that. And I look at that member, I look at that minister, and I say, I am helping them and building them up so they can be faithful and so they can be fruitful. Number 10 is to prepare all. Prepare all. Number one, prepare all for this. Number two, prepare all for the rapture. Number three, prepare all for heaven. Many times we fail to prepare even old people, aged people for death. It may be his 90 years of age, his 93 years of age, and then he's having sickness. And we don't know what last sickness he will have before he crosses over. And they call us, instead of saying, eh, Papa, are you ready for heaven? We're going to pray. And if God wants to heal you, of course he will heal you. We know that God can heal. But look at how old you are. What if God will call you home. Are you ready? We must prepare them for death. Anybody is sick will say, check up your life. Suppose a God uh, chooses to take you home. Are you ready? That's part of the ministry of uh, the apostles and the preachers and the pastors. Prepare everyone for death. After all, we know sometimes even sudden death takes place. Somebody has accident and is gone. Somebody has another child and he's gone. Well, we're not expecting that. I saw him last week. I saw him the other day. The last time we talked, we we're still planning about he will do this, he will go here, he'll go there, but now he's gone. Did you prepare him for death? Did you prepare him for the rapture? The rapture can take place anytime. And should the rapture take place anytime, prepare the people for the rapture and prepare them for heaven. Number 11, uphold the family standard. Uphold the marriage standard. Uphold it with pure love without divorce. You see, there are challenges that come in various families. And those members of the family, they look up to us. They say, I'm going to hear what my pastor will say, what my leader will say. We are upholding the family, Christian family standard. We never help, we never tell them to consider divorce or to consider separation. We're preparing them so that by the grace of God, there will be pure love in all our families in Jesus' name. Number 12, gradually reproduce Christ in every believer until we all come 
to the fullness of Christ. Look at um, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verses 11 and 12. Here is our challenge. Here is our charge. Here is our commission. It says in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse uh, 11. It says in verse 11, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now you understand? The apostles are servants to the church. The prophets are servants to the church. And the evangelists are servants to the church. And the pastors and teachers are servants to the church. But why are we given these servants? Look at verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. And for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come. Here is the purpose of God. Here is the plan of God. Till we all come in the unity of the faith unto the knowledge of the knowledge of the Son of God. Look at this. Unto a perfect man. That's the purpose of our ministry. And that's the result of our ministry. Unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what he has called us to do. God grant you more grace. God grant you more understanding. I must kill to do that effectively in Jesus' name. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 42. Acts chapter 10. We're reading from verse 42. In Acts chapter 10, reading from verse 42, here the apostle Peter, the servant, as he came to the house of Cornelius. Here is what he said, chapter 10 of Acts, reading from verse 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people. He commanded us, who were servants, and servants receive commandments and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead and to him give all the prophets uh, all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him Receiver shall receive remission of sins. And so we emphasize that Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Lord. And Jesus is the only Savior. And he will save the people as we present him appropriately in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Reading from verse 15, Acts 26, verse 15. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. I have appeared unto you for this purpose. What purpose? For service. What purpose? To go and tell the people what you ought to know. What purpose? To go and show them what I would have gone to show them if I were there by myself. To make thee a minister and a witness both of those things which thou hast seen. And of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people, from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, for to open their eyes. That's what we do. We're like um, an optician spiritually now, and we're opening their eyes to see. They have been blind to the truth. I'm blind to the Savior. 
and he sends us to go and serve them to go and minister to them open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light we're not to shout on them we're to show them the danger ahead of them the danger of remaining in darkness we're to persuade them remember we're pleading like a servant will plead Naaman was told, go deep yourself in River Jordan seven times and your flesh will come back like that of a little child. He was angry. I saw the man will come out and he'll put his hand on the place and I will be healed, me to go to Jordan and then to dip myself there seven times and not a banner and farper, greater, better, and more beautiful rivers than uh, Jordan. I won't do that. And then he was going back in anger and the servants came and pleaded with him. That's what we do when people are angry against the gospel and they're angry against what they ought to do to have eternal life. We don't bully them. We don't shout on them. And we don't say, come on here. You'll go to hell. If you don't do this, you must do this. And I can tell you what the authority of a pastor. No, we don't do that. We plead with them to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me wherefore O King Agrippa I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision i pray god will grant each of us every one of us the grace we will not be disobedient to the heavenly vision in jesus name any amen coming from there yeah. point number three now our consecration and cultivation of apostolic servanthood this apostolic servanthood does not come naturally. This apostolic servanthood does not come automatically. Okay, he has called me. And because he has called me to be this or to be that, apostolic servanthood will just come. It will be my second nature. He didn't come to the apostles by second nature. It didn't come to them automatically. It didn't come to them just like that. I'm saved, so it will come. Sanctified, so it will come. I'm baptized, it really goes, so it will come. We need to consecrate. We need to go to the altar and say, Lord, I realize I am called to serve. I am a servant. Although you have favored me to be an apostle, to be a prophet, to be an evangelist, to be a pastor, to be a teacher, to be a preacher, to be a location leader, and to be a leader of a section, thank you, Lord, for that privilege. But now I understand to serve, I need to go back to the altar and consecrate myself. And then I need to cultivate the attitude. I need to cultivate the skill. I need to cultivate the ability and the aptitude to serve as a servant. The consecration and the cultivation of apostolic servanthood. When we talk about cultivation, we're borrowing that word from the farmers. They cultivate the land. They dig up the land they throw away and cast away the stones they cut off the stones and they throw them off for burning and then they plow and they plant and they raise the seed and they water the ground they are cultivating and they put some fertilizer sometimes around the things they've cultivated and they build a fence around the farm so that uh, bees will not come in animals will not come in to destroy what they have planted all that 
goes into cultivation. And as we look at the quality of life that God wants us to live as serving, serving the people, we need to cultivate. We we'll look at our lives and dig out whatever should not be there. That one does not show that I realize I'm a servant. The way I talk to the people, that doesn't show I realize I'm a servant. And the way I, you know, command them, come here, go there, do this, I don't realize I'm a servant. And the way I walk over people, and the way I hurt them, not intentionally, but because I'm carrying myself like a great pastor. After all, I'm a king. After all, I'm a priest. After all, I'm a leader. I'm a ruler. Because because I forget that all those titles, all right, they're good, but all those titles are to make me to serve. Therefore, I forget myself. And therefore, I look at my life, and then I dig up any sin and everything that shouldn't be in my servant leadership. We're coming to Jeremiah chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 10. It says in verse 10 of Jeremiah chapter 1, See, I have this, this set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out. And then it says, and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. That's the positive side of what we are called to do, to build and to plan. But before we can do that effectively, there are things on the field. There are things in the local church we need to pull down, we need to destroy, we need to throw down, and then we plant and build. In our own personal lives in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3, Jeremiah chapter 4, Reading from verse 3, thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground. Break up your own fallow ground. Sometimes the ground of the heart is uh, hardened because many feet have gone over that land. Sometimes we're established in a habit that has become ingrained in us and it is hindering our servanthood it is hindering our service and the lord is saying before we go out there to pull down and to root out and to throw down and to build and to plant we must work on ourselves and break up our own fallow ground and so not among sons so not among sons the word we're receiving and the messages we're receiving so that they are not choked with the sons of some habits in our lives look at proverbs chapter 11 proverbs chapter 11 and i'm reading from verse 18 it says the wicked workers a deceitful work but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. We're to sow righteousness. We we'll break up a fallow ground and then we we'll sow righteousness. Hosea chapter 10. We're reading from verse 12. Hosea chapter 10. Reading from verse 12. So to yourself a righteousness we start with ourselves we start with our own hearts we start with our own methods we start with our own interaction approach to the people we're leading we start with ourselves so to yourselves in righteousness reap in mercy break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. We're presenting righteousness to the people of God. And we're presenting righteousness to the people we're ministering to. But then we ourselves must make sure that that righteousness is in us. It's on our tongue. It's in our mouth. 
it's in our eyes you know sometimes the way you look at somebody might make him to feel that it's inferior to you that's not a righteous look and the way you talk to somebody might show that hey know your place and know my place know where i am high here i know where you are down there that's not righteousness the way we come out to people and the way we come through to people may show that uh, you know we don't regard people at all but we sow to ourselves righteousness righteousness on my tongue righteousness on my lips righteousness in my behavior righteousness in my even giving instruction righteousness in everything i do and then i can help my brother my sister the people i'm supposed to serve that did you they will have righteousness i will have more righteousness i said i will have more righteousness you don't want more righteousness say it now and then you'll make more people to be righteous in jesus name now i want to do something i want you to permit me because uh, you know uh, sometimes uh, uh, maybe maybe i will tell you one of these days how messages come to me maybe i'll have time to tell you that i don't uh, do these six all by myself they come to me I look at a passage and I ask the Lord what am I going to give your people to build them up and to train them to transform their lives and God gives me and the way he gives me is the way I bring it to you and sometimes you might think it's come again he wants to do that he wants to do that and that not at all not at all in fact I debated this should I go this line or shouldn't I then I thought but God gave it to me to give to the people what right as his children what have what right does he have when god has given him the food he's taking the plate of food and the meal he's taking it to the people that is to serve and then he looks at them and says no they don't merit this piece of meat i remove it they don't merit this uh, part of the food i remove it the steward does not have that right all that has been served shall be given to the people of god and you have tremendous benefit in jesus name say good amen. amen now we're to cultivate the attitude and the conviction of his servants we are apostles we are saint ones we are pastors we are leaders but we are to cultivate we are to cultivate i need to cultivate that in my life cultivate that in my life what are we cultivating number one apostolic assurance apostolic assurance will you go away to whom shall we go thou hast the word of eternal life and we are sure that thou art the christ that assurance we must have it is the foundation of our servanthood apostolic assurance that's john chapter 6 verses 67 to 69 number two is apostolic body bearing apostolic body bearing we bear the bodies of the people and uh, the people sometimes they are under a heavy yoke under a heavy load and they are bearing the burden is so heavy on them and we are here we're just preaching if we are here we're just sending out the word we are here we're just sending out the commandment go and evangelize he has a burden that weighs him down in his family that is not helping him to go ahead and to do that galatians chapter 6 6 verses 1 and 2 the way the apostles bore burdens for people is called us to cultivate apostolic body bearing number three apostolic care and concern apostolic care and concern in second corinthians chapter 12 verse 15 the apostle paul said i will gladly spend and be spent for you I will gladly spend and be spent for you. I care. 
and I'm concerned. And we should show that care and show that concern like the apostles did. Maybe you are not naturally caring and you are not naturally concerned about people, even yourself. When you're sick, you don't worry. And when you have pain, you don't worry. And you carry that into the ministry. You know, somebody got a marriage and uh, okay, what's the big deal in that? Or somebody lost uh, somebody, what's the big deal in that? The way you feel your own iron constitution, you might carry that into the ministry. But no, this is what to cultivate. I care, I'm concerned, apostolic care and concern. Apostolic, this is the next one now, apostolic discernment. Apostolic discernment. You know, Peter came, uh, sorry, Ananas came to Peter, and then Peter immediately said, Is that all? Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And the wife came later and he said, What have you agreed together to tempt the Spirit of God? The apostles had discernment that's in acts chapter 5 verses 1 to 11 you see we must have discernment as we're ministering to people as we're interacting with people many people will come with different different things and maybe you are not discerning you just take everybody at face value whatever they say that's correct he's a child of god whatever they say that that's all right he's a member of the church we must have apostolic discernment and we cultivate that we cultivate that apostolic endurance apostolic endurance we endure in second timothy chapter 2 verse 10 i endure all things for the elect's sake we look at the elect we look at the people of god and we say i'm going to endure for their sake i will endure for their sake i will endure i don't expect them to have more self-denial than i have i don't expect them everything should move on very well and they should be the one to pay the price of everything moving on very well i must pay the price to apostolic endurance the next one apostolic faith and faithfulness apostolic faith and faithfulness you take the shield of faith the kind of faith those apostles took and they were able to quench all the furry darts of the wicked i'm crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ lives in me and the life which i now live that's paul the apostle talking i live by the faith of the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me we don't have that apostolic faith yet we don't have that apostolic faithfulness yet we cultivate we dig out is there something in my life preventing that is there something blocking that i dig that i throw it away and then i put fertilizer around my heart so that the faith and the faithfulness can grow the next one is grace apostolic grace apostolic grace i am what i am by the grace of god so the grace that was given to me was not in vain and by that same grace of God I have done more than all the other apostles put together and the apostle says it's grace it's grace we cultivate that we go to God in prayer Lord I need more grace more grace to be humble more grace to be gentle more grace to be understanding more grace to love people more grace to bear with people and more grace to go on in the work of god apostolic grace apostolic holiness how we lived behaved ourselves among you holily and justly and unblameably because you are dear unto us second first thessalonians chapter 2 that's from verse 10 now apostolic incorruptibility apostolic incorruptibility those apostles you couldn't corrupt them you couldn't corrupt them and they didn't corrupt the word of god that's in second corinthians chapter 2 verse 17 second corinthians chapter 2 verse 17 and second corinthians chapter 7 verse 2 we have corrupted no one and no one was able to corrupt us apostolic incorruptibility apostolic 
joy apostolic joy they called them acts chapter 5 verses 40 to 42 they beat them and then they sent them away and they went on rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer affliction with the lord jesus christ and in every house and every community they did not cease to preach jesus christ and then in the first peter where we read today uh, for our Sunday scripture you will see the joy that uh, the apostle was uh, talking about as he spoke about the joy that they had look at it in first peter chapter 1 verse 6 wherein he greatly rejoiced Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory of at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom have you not seen ye love? And in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice on joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's the kind of joy they had. Apostolic joy. Apostolic keeping. I have kept the faith. I have fought the fight. And what you have been given, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, keep by the Holy Ghost which abides in us. Apostolic keeping. We keep everything he has given unto us. Apostolic love. Apostolic love. Lovest thou me more than this? Yes, Lord. Lovest thou me? Yes, Lord. And the thought time, lovest thou me? Yes, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. I love thee. You love him with all your heart. Like the apostles loved him. Apostolic love. Apostolic mastery. Apostolic mastery. You master yourself. You master your members. You master your flesh. You master your desires. You master all the things that appear that in your life, they want to take the preeminence. You have the mastery. And I pray God will grant us that mastery in Jesus' name. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 25. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 25. It says, and every man that strive it for the mastery, you cultivate that. And you make sure that you go back to the cross, you go back to Calvary, and you cultivate this apostolic mastery. It says you have mastery and you are temperate in all things. Now they do each to obtain a corruptible crown. But we an incorruptible then it says i therefore so run not as certainly and uh, so fight i not as one beating the air but i keep my body under mastery you master your tongue you master your eyes you must have the members of your body. I keep my body under and bring it into subjection. Lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a cast away. Apostolic nevertheless. You know, in the language of the apostles, whenever they, they would say, we have toiled all night. And we caught nothing. And yet, because you are saying we should do this, nevertheless, at your word, it may come in your life. I did that before. I went that direction before. There is no way there. And God is saying that this is what you do. That's when you bring in 
apostolic nevertheless we, should, we did that before and the sin didn't work but nevertheless according to your word we're going to do it philippians chapter one in philippians chapter one i'm reading here from verse 23 and verse 24 it says for me straight betwixt you having a, a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. It says, when I look at every indication, and I look at all the things surrounding me, I think this will be far better. But it says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Apostolic needfulness. Apostolic nevertheless. I would have done this if I wanted to satisfy myself. I would have done that if I wanted to please myself nevertheless because of the uh, profit of the people i'm going to go this other direction p apostolic uh, apostolic obedience that's uh, that's the next one there obedience must be in our lives obedience to the great commission obedience to the great calling of the lord upon our lives and it's not just the ordinary believers obedience is the apostolic obedience you remember what you are trying to cultivate we are cultivating apostolic servant church apostolic servant church and because of that we must cultivate apostolic obedience acts of the apostles chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 29 acts of the apostles chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 29 then peter and the other apostles answered and said we ought to obey god rather than men we ought to obey god rather than men and as the obedience of the apostles then apostolic prayerfulness apostolic prayerfulness any challenge in your life take it to the lord in prayer any challenge in the family take it to the lord in prayer any challenge in your place of work take it to the lord in prayer any challenge in the local church let it, let it be that the very first thing you do is to take it to the lord in prayer not like you know we are used to doing okay i jump into conclusion i jump into decision i jump into activity i jump into action take it to the lord in prayer we're cultivating the servitude of the apostles apostolic prayerfulness we're looking at acts chapter 6 acts chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 4 but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word then apostolic questions apostolic questions the kind of questions we ask and the kind of questions we help and encourage and train our members to ask will be questions that are apostolic and you know some of the questions that those apostles ask the lord jesus christ gave us a kind of revelation that we wouldn't have had if they didn't ask that question in matthew chapter 24 i'm reading from verse 3 matthew chapter 24 reading from verse 3 and as he sat upon the mount of olives the disciples came unto him privately saying tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world the question they asked gave us the whole of chapter 24 in answer to that question and gave us the whole of chapter 25 in answer to that question and as we develop ourselves as we cultivate apostolic servitude the way we ask questions and the kind of questions we ask should bring out the depth of the revelation of god from the spirit of god apostolic renewal 
we don't say go stale we don't say go a kind of tired we don't go weary and we don't uh, it's not like you know we were so tired and we're so weary like we were yesterday so are we today no there's apostolic renewal in second corinthians chapter 4 second corinthians chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 16 second corinthians chapter 4 reading from verse 16 apostolic renewal in verse 16 here is what it says for which cause we faint not for which cause we're not weary for which cause we're not tired but though our outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day day by day the inward man is renewed day by day and as apostolic sanctification i don't many many people say i'm sanctified i'm sanctified i'm sanctified but you know there's a difference between the life of the apostles in uh, the gospels and then after chapter 17 of john and after jesus went to heaven you can see the one accord you can see the sanctification you can see the oneness you can see the unity you can see the submission sanctification like that of the apostles apostolic sanctification we're looking at uh, hebrews chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 11 hebrews chapter 2 reading from verse 11 for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one christ and those apostles all of one having the might of christ having the spirit of christ having the conviction of christ we have apostolic sanctification apostolic trustworthiness apostolic trustworthiness that the lord trusted those apostles they did not fail god they did did not betray the trust that he gave to them everywhere and in every scene they manifested that apostolic trust worthiness first thessalonians chapter 2 first thessalonians chapter 2 and i'm reading here from verse 4 in first thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 but as we were allowed of god to be put in trust with the gospel even so we speak even so we speak not as pleasing men but god which tries our hearts that's how they were trustworthy they were not willing to please any man either to escape a ju their judgment to escape their pressure to escape their punishment to escape their persecution or to curry their favor not at all they were to please god and god could trust them apostolic unity no disagreement no, no conflict but they were all with one accord in one place acts chapter 2 reading from verse 1 acts chapter 2 reading from verse 1 and when the day of pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place all with one accord in one place come to the end of that chapter reading from verse 46 in verse 46 and they continued daily with one accord continued daily with one accord that's the unity they add that's the unity the lord is calling us to that we go the same direction and we have the same mind and we do the same thing and we say the same thing first corinthians chapter one reading from verse 10 now i beseech you brethren by the name of our lord jesus christ that ye all speak the same thing 
apostolic unity that she all speak the same thing and then there's apostolic vision the vision we have shall not be a vision that is so low that we cannot see beyond our nose we cannot see beyond our immediate environment we have apostolic vision in acts of the apostles chapter 26 verse 19 acts chapter 26 verse 19 whereupon o king agrippa i was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision not disobedient unto the heavenly vision and then we should have apostolic willingness apostolic willingness to see those apostles they were willing ready to go ready to stay ready to move ready to preach ready to do everything and are willing to have imparted even their own very souls apostolic willingness is in first thessalonians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 8 first thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8 so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Apostolic willingness, apostolic extreme, self denial, self examination, rather, apostolic self x-ray that is examination the way the apostles examine themselves you're examining yourself every time am i still faithful am i still committed am i still doing what the lord has committed to my hands to do apostolic x-ray second corinthians chapter 13 I'm reading from verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith as you received it, as it was given to you, as when you started, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates, and then apostolic yoke bearing. That's the kind of yoke that God breaks, that Christ breaks. That's another yoke, the yoke of Christ himself that he wants us to bear. And he tells us, see in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, reading from verse 29. Matthew 11 verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For starchy, for my yoke is easy, and my body is light. Apostolic zeal. He wants us to be zealous, not passive, not lukewarm, not lethargic, not acting tired, not weary, not retarded not tad, tadding, that is retarding, going back, retrogressing. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 14, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, a peculiar preacher, a peculiar pastor, a peculiar leader, a peculiar servant, zealous of good works. I pray the Lord will make every one of us zealous as the Lord Jesus himself in Jesus' name. The zeal of thine house has consumed me. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore I repent the lord is calling us to a new lifestyle of leadership that's the leadership that serves the people and he wants us to understand our calling is the calling of servant church our conviction should be the conviction of servant church the comprehension 
of our commission shall be that we understand we know the servitude of the leader. And then we consecrate, we're going back to Calvary, we're going back to the cross, and we're going to cultivate once again all the attributes and all the activities and all the conviction and all the character and all the, all the various things that has to do with servanthood. And the Lord will help you, will help me, will help us to cultivate this completely in our lives so that we'll be servants of Christ and servants of God and servants of the church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's rise up, let's rise up. It's time now to cultivate. It's time now to consecrate. It's time now to go back to Calvary and say, Lord, I see leadership the way you want the leadership to be, like the leadership of the apostles in servitude. That's our calling. That's what he has called us to do. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, there must be something you have heard that necessitates prayer today that you see your calling in a new way. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. The calling of apostolic servants. As a brother, as a sister, a leader, in any capacity, the calling of a servant. Tell the Lord, now I see, now I know, not to bully people, dry people, Control people, browbeat people, knock them out, knock them down. Not to put herself over a throne, above the people, in charge, in control. Let's come down to the level of the people. Let's come down to serve. Serve. That's a calling to serve. The calling, the conviction of apostolic servants. Have you noticed Paul, I'm a servant. Peter, I'm a servant. James, I'm a servant. Jude, I'm a servant. John the Beloved, I'm a servant. Let Calvary crush out the pride. Let Calvary crush out the iron hand, the iron attitude, the militant control. The mind to push others down. The habit walking over people. Let's take that to Calvary. Break up your fallow ground. So not among the thorns. Remember the comprehensiveness of our commission. Seek the lost. Don't wait for them to come to you. Seek them out. However dirty, their slum, their area, Anywhere they are, go to them where they are. Patiently, persuasively, preach repentance unto them. Patiently, perseveringly, show them that Christ is the only Savior and bring them to face in Christ. 
And as they get converted, help them, teach them the new life of righteousness of the believer. If that's not part of what you are used to, cultivate it. If that has not been your practice, cultivate it. That's how we came. So that we'll see what we still need in our servant leadership and consecrate and cultivate and develop and reproduce all that God wants in our lives. Emphasize instantaneous sanctification and practical holiness in the lives of the people. Let them know the law of God counts. The commandment of God counts. If anyone is going to get to heaven, pray that God will help you to minister to the sick effectively. Pray that God will help you to minister to those who have demonic problems, psychological problems, oppressive spirits tormenting them. Pray that God will help you to serve everyone so you'll bring them out of that bondage. Train the members to be faithful in little things, in big things, in major things, and prepare the members for life, for death, for the rapture, for heaven. Uphold family standards. With your own example in your family, your own model in the family, help other families that they will have godly marriages and Christian families. Help the babes in Christ to grow. Grow to maturity. Reproducing Christ in them until they move closer and closer. to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. Cultivation by the farmer takes time. You are going to cultivate servant leadership to take time. You don't stop the prayer here. Go back home and take the cultivation of apostolic servanthood, servant leadership. Take it so important. Have an unshakable assurance of who Christ is. As if you can see Christ face to face, having Apostolic assurance. Can you bear any burden at all? Your own personal burden? The burden of members of your family? And the burden of the church? Pray that God will help you to have apostolic but in bearing apostolic care and concern 
you forget yourself launch out reach out care for people and be concerned for people as a servant apostolic discernment you can discern when an evil spirit is in action and you cast it out apostolic endurance things to endure and you're not complaining things to endure you're not murmuring things to endure you're not reacting apostolic faith build your faith increase your faith deepen your faith heighten your faith and your faithfulness apostolic grace my grace is sufficient for you you need more grace you need greater grace you need abundant grace to be all you need to be apostolic holiness transparent not something superficial apostolic incorruptibility nobody can corrupt you you have clear definite scriptural conviction joy joy under persecution joy under misapprehension misunderstanding misinterpretation joy apostolic keeping that everything he has given you you are able to keep apostolic love you love god you love christ you love the church you love everyone you are called to minister to apostolic mastery you master yourself you master your flesh you master your desires apostolic nevertheless i would have gone there nevertheless at thy word left to myself i would have done that nevertheless because of what your word demands i'll obey you apostolic obedience Apostolic prayerfulness. Apostolic questions. No more foolish questions. Ignorant questions. Defiling questions. Apostolic questions that bring answers solutions from uh, heaven apostolic renewal you are renewed day by day your heart your spirit your resolution your decision your mind renewed day by day apostolic sanctification your heart your spirit apostolic trust worthiness something can be committed into your hands that's total trustworthiness unity apostolic unity vision don't be visionless apostolic willingness apostolic self-examination x-ray
apostolic yoke bearing with apostolic zeal may the lord do it in every one of our lives in jesus name and the people of god said and the servants of god said father we thank you for such an enriching time together thank you for opening our eyes to see what kind of position kind of place kind of leadership servanthood you have called us to we pray lord your grace will multiply in every one of our lives in jesus name and we pray lord that all these things have exposed to us you implant in every heart you're right on the tables of our hearts as we go further in prayer in our houses and everywhere we go we pray all these qualities of christ and the apostles you bring up in every one of our hearts and lives in jesus name and our ministries will bring more souls into the kingdom and great will be our reward here on earth and for all eternity in jesus name go with your people as they go back home watch over your people surround your people with mercy and love and we pray lord this work will prosper in their hands in our hands all together in jesus name the grace of the lord be with you the love of god abound in your life and the fellowship of the holy spirit abound in every one of our lives in jesus name go on and become stronger and stronger deeper and deeper wider in the ocean of the love of god in jesus name lord we thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray amen, 